です。Hello, everyone, and welcome to our public class. Um, tonight's class is the last in this series of online events for the Ignorant Arts School, sit-in number one.、Uh, as it's the end of term, we're taking you on a virtual pub crawl across time and space as we visit a few of my favourite public houses from the past. As pubs in Scotland remain closed and many face an uncertain future, it seems like a good time to think about the potential of the public house. Along the way, we'll meet friends and listen to a few stories. We'll end up at a pub quiz with prizes hosted by artist Yara El Shabini and Hussein Mita, which I know some of you have booked in for already.、Uh, so, to get us started, I'd like to share a story. It's a song, and it's called "Where You're Meant to Be." It's by Aidan Moffat, and it's about finding the right pub for you. Well, we decided we would try an unfamiliar bar to buy a soothing pint to cool the afternoon, and so we roamed the Glasgow streets in search of fine and foreign treats to be gulped and guzzled, swigged and swallowed down. And so the first place that we stopped, they clearly didn't own a mop, but the karaoke gave us both a laugh. We watched the steamers howl, but the drink was fucking foul. So we downed it quick, and soon we both were off. And we found a new place quick, but we had fallen for a trick. The windies on the outside were near real. We knew that something was near right. The place was spoiling for a fight, but we braved the bar with our new nerves of steel. But we duly gave up hope when someone shouted, "Fuck the Pope!" And across the bar, the target hears his call. So then he shouts, "Fuck the Queen!" and makes a gesture quite obscene. So we ran away and shouted, "Fuck them all!" <laughs> Then we headed further west, where we were told we'd find the best, and fair enough, the drink was much improved. But then we bumped into this prick that kept on flashing us his dick, so we backed away and quickly made a move. And we hadn't he walked too far until we found a cocktail bar with fancy drinks of blue and green and red. But they soon sucked up all the cash, so it was time to make a dash. So I turned to Jim, and this is what I said: Shall we just go to the place of many a familiar face, the pub we should have went to from the off? There's never any loons, and there's a jukebox full of tunes. There's no finer place in town to quip and quaff. And so that's now where we are. We're standing swaying by the bar, catching eyes and full of grog and glee. Jimmy gets around and pays, raises a pint and proudly says, "You always come to where you're meant to be." So I find pubs and pretty fascinating spaces, and by that I don't mean bars and shiny new places, but proper old pubs and the unique ecosystem, traditions, and set of acceptable behaviours that we find inside them.、Uh, like many people, I have what you might call a love-hate relationship with pubs, and as a woman. There are certain ones you know just not to go in at all. There is often an unspoken knowledge of where and where not to enter. Now, when we think about the history of pubs, we might think of it as a typically male and working class culture that surrounds them. But if we go back to pre-industrialization, when brewing was a decentralized process, it took place on a domestic small scale, and it was carried out mostly by women who were known as alewives. Gradually, as these alewives became celebrated within their communities, local people would go into their houses to drink and to exchange or buy ale. It became custom that when, after a few days, when the ale had brewed, 
the alewife would create a makeshift bar indoors and place an ale steak or broom outside the house, transforming the home into a public space and in turn establishing the tradition of the pub sign hanging on a pole. During the Middle Ages, most people drank a weak form of ale daily, which was brewed from barley every few days. And because of this long boiling process, it was actually safer to drink than most of the water available. Town councils legislated the selling of ale and single women were not allowed to brew, hence the name alewives or brewsters as they were sometimes known. Hops come into Scotland in the 15th century and that means the creation of beer rather than ale and that lasts longer so the brewing process becomes more commercially viable. And in Scotland, um, women actually stay dominant in brewing later than in England because hops comes to Scotland later. So as we're thinking about this female origin of the public house, let us first visit, let, let us visit our first establishment. It's at number 438 Old Ford Road in Bow, East London, and it's called the Mother's Arms, and it's not really a pub at all. In 1915, the activist, artist and suffragette Sylvia Pankhurst took over number 438, a former public house called the Gunmaker's Arms. And as an ardent pacifist, she renamed it the Mother's Arms. The Gunmaker's Arms got its name from the Gunmaker's Arms opposite at the site of what was the London small arms factory and arms supplier to the British Armed Forces. It was sited here so they could transport gun parts on the canal to and from their other factory in Enfield. This building was one of many in the area taken over by the East London Federation of Suffragettes around this time. And other projects included a cooperative toy factory which supplied London's luxury West End department stores and a cost price restaurant. 40 children were cared for in the mother's arms which was run by Lucy Burgess and Minnie Lansbury. It was used as a clinic for mothers and babies and as a creche, which allowed poorer mothers to go out to work. The clinic provided information on hygiene and basic nutrition, and the nursery was using radical childcare methods under the Montessori method. They installed um, little tables and chairs, which allowed the children to take part in self-directed uh, learning and play. The main bar became a reception behind from which medicines and fresh eggs were distributed freely. The old bar parlor became a doctor's surgery and upstairs was a nursery. Later, they also opened a soup kitchen to feed the local poor. The next image shows uh, Charles Booth's color-coded uh, poverty map of Bow around 1900. And it shows many areas of blue housing. These are areas he described as very poor with chronic want. Sylvia was an artist before she was an activist. She said she gave up art because she saw starvation and need within her community. And here at the Mother's Arms, Sylvia keeps the tradition of the pub name, but reclaims the pub as a female caregiving space. It has a lot to do with much of the mutual aid work we see going on in communities now. But even before the pandemic, food banks are as common a sight as pubs in our towns and cities. Isn't that enough to make you want to drown your sorrows? Perhaps this is why across the UK, we apparently have over 3000 words to describe states of drunkenness. Where I grew up in Fife, the word getting steaming was used and it was a rite of passage. But it wasn't until recently that I actually learned the origin of the word. It's from Glaswegian day trippers boozing on steamboats up and down the Clyde in the late 19th century. Boats were the only places you could legally buy alcohol on a Sunday. Another word for drunk, which I think is from more from the northeast of Scotland, is bleezing. And so let's hear that word put to good use. This is Sheila Stewart with her tragic story, Blue Bleezing Blind Drunk. Friends, I have a sad story, a very sad story to tell. I married a man for his money, but he's worse than the devil himself. For when Mickey comes home, I get battered. 
Lee. He batters me all black and blue. And if I say a word, I get scattered from the kitchen right then to the room. So I'll go and I'll get blue bleas and blind drunk just to give Mickey a warning. And just for spite, I will stay out all night and come rolling home drunk in the morning. Oh, but whiskey, I ne'er was a lover. But what can a poor woman do? I'll go and I'll drown all me sorrows, but I wish I could drown Mickey too. So I'll go and I'll get blue bleas and blind drunk, just to give Mickey a warning. And just for spite, I will stay out all night and come rolling home drunk in the morning. So I hope you've finished your drink as we're moving on from the mother's arms. I now invite you to come to the east coast of Scotland to the Goths, where we are meeting Henry Bell. And now Henry is not going to be talking about this Wetherspoons pub of the same name in Helensboro, but a much more inspiring model known as the Gothenburg system. So Henry, over to you. Hi, thanks Ruth. Um, hopefully we can reclaim the Henry Bell in Helensboro soon. Um, so uh, yeah, welcome to the Dean Tavern uh, in sunny Newton Grange or Nitton, uh, as it is to locals such as you and I. Um, we're going to get around in here, uh, not just because we want a drink, but also because the profits are going to be democratically redistributed amongst the community. And honestly, what could be more refreshing than that? Um, the Dean Tavern, uh, which is still uh, in existence, um, this is it 100 years ago in my background, um, is a goth pub. Um, the Goths are a model of public house ownership that stands against uh, privatised profit from alcohol. Um, I think all good uh, stops on a pub crawl uh, involve a bit of theory, so I wanted to quickly introduce some and talk about um, what the feminist geography collective G.K. Gibson Graham call capitalist centricism, um, which is an analytic stance that posits capitalism as all-consuming, omnipresent and coherent. Um, and their work beyond capitalist centricism was a lot about trying to find diverse economies and spaces that, um, that subvert that and kind of all the lived existences that aren't subject to capital. And um, the goth pubs are one of those lived experiences. They're one of those diverse economies um, that spring up. And um, these ones spring up around the east of Scotland, around Fife uh, and the Lothians. Um, so... This talk is going to be about what were the goth pubs uh, and what do they mean today. So for some context, um, the goth pubs uh, sprang up uh, around the end of the 19th century um, as rapid industrialization transformed factories and mines uh, and drove uh, nearly half the population of Scotland into urban centres, um, creating deprivation uh, and hunger on an unprecedented scale. Um, the Scottish working class lived in some of the worst conditions in Europe at the time, with a life expectancy of just 40 years. Um, the ultimate cause of that misery, as we all know, was capitalism. Uh, but for many, the proximate cause was alcohol. Um, and in the villages of Fife, where an influx of immigrant labor arrived, there was a growing population and a lack of pubs um, and a huge rise in street drinking and in arrests for street drunkenness. By 1900, Scotland's prisons were full to capacity, and that was largely due to an increase in arrests for drunkenness. Um, at the same time, mine owners in Fife and the Lothians, uh, who for centuries had just tried to extract as much coal as pack horses could carry to ports and towns, now pushed the workers to mine as much coal as could fill trains and steamships at Methyl. Um, two powerful social movements emerged to combat these evils of drink and deprivation. Uh, one was socialism, hooray and the other was temperance. Mm. Um, both found a firm foothold uh, in Dundee and Fife. Um, they were both millenarian movements that believed that a golden era for mankind could be achieved through a kind of social and moral revolution that felt imminent. Um, 
they were very kind of separate ideologies in a big way. One sought to, to kind of prohibit the possession of private property and the other to prohibit alcohol. Um, but they would often come together. And one of the places that they came together was the founding of Gothenburg pubs, such as the Dean Tavern. Um, there's sometimes an easy coalition between socialists and the temperance movement had always been strong in Scotland. Uh, in Dundee, it was a prohibitionist who unseated Winston Churchill. In Glasgow, the great red Clydeside hero John McLean never touched a drop of alcohol. Um, Dundee's own Prohibition and Reform Party was a founding constituent of the Communist Party of Great Britain in 1920. And from the late 19th century, Dundee had a number of temperance hotels, which were basically dry public houses. Um, in Fife, a different solution emerged, and that was the goth pubs. Um, for prohibitionists, this was a problematic thing. There were still places where you could buy drink, but for the temperance movement, it was seen as a step forward. Um, and for socialists, it was seen as a, a redistributive economy. So what is a goth pub? Um, in technical terms, a goth or a Gothenburg pub is a drinking establishment which is collectively owned and which is, uses the profits generated from the sale of alcohol to pay for improvements for the local community, from midwives to libraries. Um, up to 95% of the profit can be returned to the persons who supply the capital for opening the pub, which was often the miners in a particular village, but the remaining 95% was to be redistributed in the community. Um, the Goths themselves were often austere and designed to discourage drunkenness. The Dean Tavern, as you can see, doesn't have tables or chairs. It's not a place to hang about in. Um, and also the managers and workers received no sales-based pay. There was no encouragement to sell drink. Uh, and often there would be uh, kind of temperance rooms where people wouldn't drink alcohol. Um, as the name the Gothenburg suggests, uh, the pubs uh, got their name from the town of Gothenburg, um, which had had total prohibition for a period and then reintroduced alcohol sales, uh, but only granting a license to one citywide trust uh, where the money would go to improve the city. So close links between the east of Scotland uh, and Sweden, um, kind of the five coal fields supplying coal to the Swedish railways, a port link between Methel and Gothenburg, Swedish iron coming in, to Scottish ports um, meant that this model in Gothenburg was known about and it was kind of experimented with in Fife um, and the Lothians. Um, it was known about in England as well, but it doesn't seem to have been tried anywhere else. Um, so why were the goth pubs uh, so favoured in the east of Scotland? Why were they all emerging in Fife and the Lothians? I think uh, one of the reasons that they were favoured in these mining areas um, was the same reason that socialism often flourished uh, in these communities. Um, there were places where there was stark deprivation, there was a big need for community where immigrants uh, had come in in large numbers, displaced from other parts of the country, the Highlands, uh, Ireland, um, Italy, other places, um, and where their own exploitation was really evident to them because a mining company often in towns like Cowdenbeath and Loch Ely wouldn't just be the only source of income for families, but it would also be the only source of housing, the only source of shops, um, and would provide the bare minimum for its workers. Um, that stark experience of capitalism had a, uh, a kind of radicalizing effect on the miners uh, of Fife and the Lothians. Um, and that radicalization led to a proliferation of socialist groups and cooperative associations that were trying to build power and autonomy for the workers. Um, it, in many cases, the founding of a goth pub was part of this quest for autonomy. Um, it was a place where miners could come together to try and wrest control of their leisure time from the coal masters. Um, it could function as a social centre and a meeting place, but also its profits would go on to furnish the town with amenities that it wouldn't otherwise have enjoyed. Um, Scotland's oldest surviving goth pub in Armadale, which is still open, uh, was founded by local miners um, who kind of went in with the temperance movement and sought money from local cooperatives um, and eventually opened a goth pub that was able to raise money for their local community. Um, the money that uh, originally founded the Dean Tavern and other goths was often supplied though by the mine owners themselves and by the coal masters so that so as well as being a kind of commons and a radical space they were also a way in which the mine owners sought to kind of uh, ameliorate any uh, kind of unrest in the towns and try and give people just enough or just enough space 
to get by on. So the question emerges, are they a reformist uh, thing? Do they kind of suppress working class autonomy or are they a revolutionary thing that encourages working class uh, autonomy? And I think the goth pubs inarguably represent a compromise between the workers and the bosses. Um, they're a move for the community that, that allows them to combat some of the destructive effects of capitalism and alcoholism that were kind of uh, rampant at this time in these mining communities. Um, but they also maybe dampen struggle and they maybe lead to more drinking and more problematic um, suffering for particularly families um, at the time. Um, but inarguably they are a place that belong to the community and they do have a social function and they ensure that the money came back to the community rather than being extracted by landlords or bosses. Um, in many cases, the pubs were run at the time and the ones that still exist are still run by a board uh, that can be elected by the village or by drinkers in the pub. Um, the board often would have been miners at the time. Now it's often kind of locals and regulars that support the bar. Um, and yeah, this, these goths kind of created a, a genuinely public house and a, a space where a community could own its own meeting place and its own means of leisure. Um, I think that the thing that excites me about Fife kind of historically is the kind of little Moscows of Fife and the autodidacts and Italian communists of the 1920s and 30s, um, the communist MPs later, socialist MPs like Jenny Lee. And I think all that history of Fife um, in a significant way, although it comes later, is linked to these Gothenburg pubs and these first community owned, commonly held spaces uh, in those little villages where people could come together and perhaps have that feeling of, of community power. Um, but yeah, I think it's arguable that they are the first, first community owned spaces. Um, in, in the industrial sites of East Scotland. Um, as the goth pubs kind of spread across the country, more than 100 of them opened in Scotland. Um, they started to develop their own architecture, their own aesthetics. Um, in the Review of Scottish Culture, Mark Mulhern describes it as an overblown garden city or arts and crafts style. You can see in the Dean Tavern behind me, there's this attempt at a kind of great airy space, the opposite of the mines that the, the drinkers there would have been in. Um, but as well as a kind of grandeur and arts and crafts thing, there's also a very austere Calvinist influence to these pubs. And if you look at enough of them, you see a kind of confusing mix of mock Tudor beams and turrets um, and a feeling that they're kind of caught between Walter Crane and John Knox. Um, the Dean Tavern itself is Tudor on the outside and then this kind of a Victorian industrial space inside. Um, if, uh, if the Goths uh, had a pastoral aesthetic outside, often inside, yeah, it was, it was no chairs, no table, no heat, uh, an attempt to discourage lingering and discourage drinking. Um, I don't think that survives in the Goths that exist today, particularly, um, of which there are four that are still open. There's the Dean Tavern in Nitton Grange, there's the Goth in Armandale, uh, the Preston Grange, Gothenburg in Preston Pans, and the Gothenburg in Fallon. Um, I think these pubs still provide a space for us to stop and examine the world uh, and think about the drinkers and socialists and communities that have come before us in these pubs. Um, they're a kind of small set of alternative economies um, and truly community owned pubs. Um, and I hope that soon they'll reopen uh, after restrictions are lifted and we can go on a real pub crawl uh, around them. So yeah, thanks very much. Thank you, Henry. Um, that's super interesting. And I can't wait to visit um, some of the surviving Goths in real life, which now have actual tables and chairs inside them. Um, we are off on our final stop of the night now. Um, we're going to hitch a lift upon this fallen star and make our way down to the Tabridge Bar, where we're meeting Yara and Hussein for our pub quiz. Make sure you put on your jackets because I hear it's raining in Dundee. And for those of you who are not taking part in this quiz, um, I thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, to play us out, here is Edinburgh's Sangstream Choir for a somewhat uncanny artistic vision. And for those of you who are taking part in the quiz, we will be having a short break and we will resume shortly after this song. Thank you. Thank you. 
upon this body.